Welcome to Living the New Life with Valentine Okeke. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. This Sunday is a special Sunday. It marks the beginning of a new week. It also marks the beginning of a new month. And not just a new month, it is the last month of the year, 2019. God has been faithful and kind and merciful towards us. Not all that started the year with us are still alive. Some are still battling with their lives in the hospital. But he had deemed it fit that we all are still alive. Amen. Last week, we agreed that we are going to start this month of December with praying and fasting. Why should we do that? In many assemblies, they wait until January to start their fasting. There is nothing wrong with that. But I believe that we must have to be seven steps ahead of the devil. I'm sure in my spirit that many of us are not where we ought to be this year. Many of us don't like what we've been getting this year. And the only way you can change the course of your direction is for you to start something ahead of time before the 1st of January 2020. That's one of the main reasons why we call this fast. And we said that we're going to do a 12-day fast, taking each day. So what we're going to do this morning is for us to learn what fasting is all about so that we wouldn't just be doing dieting because when you go without food all in the name of fasting you're simply dieting so we're going to learn briefly what fasting is all about the importance of it and how we ought to go about it the things that we need to put in place for us to be able to have an effective fasting. Is that okay? Okay. If you go to Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 14 to 15, it says there that if my people that are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and forsake their evil ways, he said, I will hear their prayers, I will heal their land, and so on and so forth. If my people that are called by my name, what name are we called by? We are called Christians, the in Christ dead one. So God said, if we Christians will humble ourselves and pray and seek my face, and forsake our evil ways, our wicked ways. He said, I will hear. Let's quickly go there because I need to point out certain things of importance. Second Chronicles chapter 7. I will begin to read from verse 14. It says, Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, And pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. Verse 15. I will listen to every prayer made in this place. I will listen to what? Every prayer made 
in this place. Let's pick out some things there. If we will humble ourselves, if we will recognize our inability to help ourselves, if we will recognize our shortcomings and come before God, knowing that He said He will guide us along the best pathway for our individual lives, He said, I will hear from heaven. The number two, he said, and pray. That means commune with him. That means acknowledge him in all things. Discuss everything with him. And seek my face. What does it mean to seek my face? To seek God's face simply means the exercise we're about to start, which is fasting. Because when you seek his face, that means you're forsaking every other thing. You're giving him the attention that he desires and deserves. When you're seeking his face, that means that you're putting aside every other thing and you're giving him first place. So to seek his face there simply means fast. And turn from your wicked ways. What does it mean? It simply means for you to turn away from the desires of the flesh. Part of it is the food. Part of it is your attitude. Part of it is your behavior. Part of it is the way you go about things. Part of it is everything that is contrary to the principles and word of God. God expects us to turn away from it. He expects us to turn away from known sin. He said, when you do that, I will hear from heaven. It's a promise. And he said, I will forgive your sins and heal your land. Our land like never before needs the touch of the master. Our land is seriously sick. The rate of insecurity, the rate of injustice shows that our land is very sick, very, very sick, and it needs the healing of the master. And he promised in verse 15, I will listen to every prayer made in this place. In this place, this place simply means this season. This season that we have set aside to humble ourselves in prayer and fasting before him, God said, I'm going to hear the prayers that you offer to me. So let's begin our journey this morning so that we can understand what we want to embark on. Because I don't want us to carry out any religious exercise by which you keep looking at the time. Oh, he said 6 p.m. Then you try and look for something to do to fill up the time. So I'm going to take you through what I expect you to know and what I expect you to do. Anytime we talk about fasting, I enjoy it, I love it, because of the tremendous benefits and the rewards that follow it. Some of them I'm going to share with you this morning. So the discipline of fasting releases the anointing of God. That's the first thing, the discipline of fasting releases the favor of God. The discipline of fasting releases the blessings of God in the life of a Christian. Those three principal things are the first thing 
that happens to a Christian when you cultivate and make fasting a lifestyle. And I can tell you how you can do that so that every month of the year you will be able to take it out from the hands of the devil and key in into God's plans and purposes for that month. You can cultivate the habit of fasting three days in January, the first three days of January. Don't spend it eating food. Spend it to seek the face of God concerning the month of January. For the month of uh, February, which is the second month of the year, you can equally take a three days fast. Then in the month of March, which is the third month, you also take a three days fast. Month of April, the fourth month, you take a four days fast. The month of May, the fifth month, you take a five days fast. You can see it's increasing. By June, the sixth month, you take a six days fast. By July, the seventh month, you take a seven days fast. By seven days, I mean the first seven days of the month of July. In August, the eighth month, you take eight days fast. September, nine days. October, ten days the 10th month. The 11th month, November, you take 11 days fast. And in December, the last month, the 12th month, you take a 12 days fast. And you can break it into three, the first four days, thanking God for having led you that far. The next four days, you begin to seek his will concerning the things of the new year. Why the last four days? You can use it to praise and worship him and believe in him for boldness to be able to face the challenges of the new year. Have you seen it? So before others will even wake up in January to start praying. You've already shaped the new year. That's strategic planning. So the discipline of fasting releases the anointing, the favor, and the blessings of God in the life of a Christian. Fasting is a secret key that unlocks heaven's door and slams shut the gates of hell. So when you hear the word fasting too many times, what comes to your mind is, oh, it's time not to eat. But it's not just not the time to eat. There must be a hunger in your heart. Because we are told in Matthew Chapter 5, verse 6. Can we quickly go there? Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. About those that hunger and test after righteousness. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. We are told that God blesses those who are hungry and thirsty for justice. One translation says righteousness. For they will receive it in full. That means those that hunger and test after having right relationship with God, God promises that they will have him in full. So when you talk about fasting, we're, we're talking not just you're not eating food, but we're talking about a hunger in your heart 
that drives you to make you to forsake eating food and giving priority to spiritual food, which is the Word of God. Is that okay? Just like the psalmist said in Psalm 42, let's go there. He says, As the deer panted for the waters, so my soul. He says, that As the deer pants for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I test for you, the living God. When can I come and stand before him? Day and night, I have only tears for food, while my enemies continually taunt me, saying, Where is this God of yours? But the key thing I want you to see there is that as the dare pines for the streams of water, the psalmist said, So my soul longs after you. So when we talk about fasting, we are talking about the longing of your soul and your spirit for you to get in tune, in alignment with the will of God. So it's not just forsaking food. We are talking about a deeper hunger. Because you see, whatever you put first determines what happens along the line. If you put your spirit first, it will drive your soul, it will drive your body. But when you put your body first, your flesh first, it drives your spirit it drives your soul. So first and first, God expects us, being spiritual beings, to do what? To put our spirit first, so that it will control every other thing. But the reverse is the case. We'll put our flesh first. No wonder we are so powerless. We often complain, grip, we murmur, simply because we are not putting the first in first. So I'm really sure this morning that you don't want to go through the next year the same way you did this year. How many of you will want to go next year the same way you're going this year? How many of you will want to go the, the next 30 days the same way you did the previous month? So that's why we have called for a fast, so that we can change things, so that we can come in alignment with God's perfect will. I believe that some of us are not where we want to be. You know deep inside your heart that there is an assignment that God has for your life. You know that there are things that God desires to raise in your life. And you have that genuine desire to see these things come to pass. The only way you can get those things done is through this prayer and fasting. So the question is, what is biblical fasting? Biblical fasting is refraining from food for spiritual purpose. You are refraining from food for spiritual purpose. And when you do that, it brings you into a deeper, more intimate and powerful relationship with the Lord. God expects this to be a normal routine with his children, setting aside time to commune with him. So we're going to see the three specific duties of a Christian this morning, what God expects us as his children to always do. So from there, we'll be able to look into other things. But before we do that, I want you to take note that fasting is a secret source of power. Many of us desire to have power. We want the anointing. 
fasting will help you to accomplish that. So let's quickly go to Matthew chapter 6. It's a long passage. We'll read from verses 1 to 18. I want to show you the three duties of every Christian. Then we'll take it up from there. Is that okay? So once we are done with that, then we'll look at the benefits of fasting. Then from there, we'll see how we need to navigate through that discipline. So Matthew chapter 6, I begin to read from verse 1. It says that, Take care. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired because then you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give a gift to someone in need, don't shout about it as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogue and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. These days, they call press conference. They do media briefing. Just to get attention. I assure you, they have received all the rewards they will ever get. But when you give to someone, don't tell your left hand what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in secret. And your father who knows all secrets will reward you. What did he say about giving? He said, give it in what? In secret. So that your father who knows all secrets will reward you. Verse 5. And now about prayer. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in synagogues where everyone can see them. Many religions practice that. I assure you, that is all the reward that they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your father secretly. Then your father who knows all secrets will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think that their prayers are answered only by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, because your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. Isn't that encouraging? That even before you set out to say anything, your father already knows exactly what you need. That explains why he says, seek you first his kingdom and his righteousness and every other thing will be added unto you. He said that you are more valuable than the birds of the earth. Verse 9. He said, pray like this. It's now giving you a prayer pattern. Our Father in heaven, may your name be honored. What does it mean to honor his name? It means putting him first in everything that you do, in everything that you think, and in everything that you desire. He said, Our Father in heaven, may your name be honored. I'm adding there in my life. You have to personalize it. When you honor his name in your life, that means you're putting him first in everything that you're doing. May your kingdom come. And may your will be done here on earth. I removed the earth. I said, may your will be done in my life. Just as it is in heaven. Give us our food today. What is the food that they are asking God to give them? Is it your semovita and rice and beans and yam? I don't think that's what he's talking. He's talking there about spiritual food which is the word of God. So you can say, give us your word for today, because for every blessed day, God has a word for you. He has a will for your life. 
You see why you have to come to him early in the morning? So that you can hear his word. So that you can hear that that he wants you to do for the day. Just like Jesus Christ, he said, I've not come to do my will, but the will of my Father. That my greatest desire is to please him in everything that I'm doing. So we must cultivate that habit of coming to him early in the morning and ask him for our daily bread, which is the word of God. Then he says there in verse 12, And forgive us our sins, just as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. And do not let us yield to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Verse 14. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Verse 16. And when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, who try to look pale and disheveled, so people will admire them for their fasting. I assure you, that is the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face, then no one will suspect your fasting except your father who knows what you do in secret, and your father who knows all secrets will reward you. Did you get that? So the three duties of a Christian is to give, to pray, and to fast. What did I say? The three duties of a Christian is to give, to pray, and to fast. Because he said, when you give, when you pray, and when you fast. It comes in that order. Just like we've been commanded to love. To love means to give. For God so loved the world that he gave. So the first duty of a Christian is to do what? Is to give. The second duty is to? The third duty is to? And that's what it meant when he said that when you sow, you will reap thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. So I believe in my heart that when you give, you receive thirtyfold. When you combine your giving with your prayers, you receive sixtyfold. And when you do these three, when you give, pray, and fast, you will receive a hundredfold return. You know, in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12, he said, a tree braided cord is not easily broken. Am I right? So that's what he's talking about there. You give, you pray, and you fast. There are the three duties that God expects his children to carry out on a daily basis, or often. Did you get that? Why is it very important that you pray? Because there are some supernatural things that can only be released through praying and fasting. You remember the incidents of the demon-possessed boy? that the Father brought to the disciples, when Jesus Christ came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, the father of this young chap met Jesus Christ and complained to him. He said, this my son is often vexed by the spirit of suicide. At times you throw him into the fire, or into the waters. And I brought him to your disciples and they couldn't do anything. Jesus Christ looked at the man and said, bring the boy. And he spoke and the demon 
that was tormenting that boy left him. The disciples were marveled. When they were with him privately, they came to him and said, Master, why was it that we couldn't do anything about this case? Because some days back, you gave us power over demonic powers. We were casting out devils, we were healing the sick, and everything was going well. But why? This one really disgraced us and embarrassed and humiliated us. He looked at them, he said, it's because you don't have faith. If you only have faith, as little as a mustard seed, that you can say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and the mountain will obey you. Then he turned around and said, with God, nothing is what? Impossible. But he didn't stop there. He said, how be it? This particular case can only be handled through prayer and what? And fasting. So there are some supernatural things. There are some situations in your life that you just have to apply fasting, prayer and fasting for you to be able to deal with such situations. Are you getting it? So fasting is for everyone. It's not just for the ministers or for the church workers or for the great men and the women of God. God expects his children to cultivate the habit of fasting. And I've given you an idea what you can do so that you can bring every month in focus before God. If you can take out that pattern that I gave to you, you will be able to ship every month and whatever challenges that the enemy throw at you, you will be on top of the situation. Is that okay? So why is it important that we fast? Number one, it causes God to target your children. It causes God to target your children. When you fast, you effectively put your children in the hands of God. Because part of the reward that God gave is that you're going to build the foundation of many generations. If you go to Isaiah 58, I think verse 12. So to build the foundation of many generations means that you will be able to Lay a very solid foundation for your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren. So when you fast and pray, you begin to shape their destiny. It's just like when you go to families that are into this fetish thing, it also shapes their life. Likewise, when you cultivate the habit of praying and fasting all the time, you begin to shape the life of your children. So that's the first benefit. The second benefit is that it brings health and healing to your body. It brings health and healing to your body. Number three is that it brings financial prosperity. I know you like to hear that. But don't forget that prosperity is not just financial. There are things that you must put in place for you to prosper. And I said that those three things, they are what? Praying, planning, and preparing. If you don't do that, just forget it. Fasting alone cannot do it. After you must have fasted, you need to back it up with prayer, you need to plan, and you need to prepare. Number four, fasting brings the blessings of God. Number five, fasting can break generational causes and end demonic attack on your family. Fasting can break generational causes and end demonic attack on your family. 
Number six, fasting brings you to a place of being able to clearly hear God's will. It brings you to a place where you can clearly, or where you are able to clearly hear God's will. We are talking about the benefits of fasting, so that that can motivate you for you to take up this fasting period seriously. Number seven, it sharpens the blade and sharpens the word in your heart and in your mouth. Fasting will sharpen the blade and sharpen the words in your heart and in your mouth. Allowing you to cut away the dead flesh and hidden sin. So when you fast and pray, it will sharpen the word of God in your heart and in your mouth, thereby allowing you to cut away dead flesh and hidden sin as you set yourself apart for God. Because as you fast and pray, and you do it earnestly, the such light of God will flood your heart and every hidden sin will come up. Bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, God will bring all of them up because those are hindrances expecting you to deal with them. People that offended you, even when you were still very young. He will bring all those things to heart. And just like the psalmist, it's a time for you to say, Search my heart. If there is any iniquity, if there is anything that offends you, bring it to light so that I will ask you for forgiveness. Then, number eight, fasting will bring you into alignment with God's plan for your life. That is very important. Fasting will bring you into alignment with God's plan for your life. Number nine, fasting will bring you into destiny. Fasting will bring you into destiny. Number ten, Fasting will help you to distinguish between what you want and what you really need. You know, many of us, we don't know what we need. What you really need in life. So many people are confused. They don't know their right from their left. But when you fast and pray, it will help you to distinguish between what you want and what you really need. Number 11, fasting will help you to establish dominion and authority over your flesh. It will help you to establish what? Dominion and authority over your flesh. I think we might need to key in into the scriptures now to see what we mean by flesh so that you can see what fasting will help you to deal with. Let's quickly go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. I will begin to read from verse 19. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, which is flesh, your lives will produce these evil results. 
when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, when you follow the desires of your flesh, your lives will produce these uh, sinful results. The first one, sexual immorality, impure thoughts, eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, participation in demonic activities, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, divisions, the feeling that everyone is wrong except those in your own little group, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other kinds of sin. Let me tell you again, as I have done before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Is that in your Bible? The consequences of living in the flesh, it says you will not inherit the kingdom of God. What does it mean by inheriting the kingdom of God? Some people will tell you you will not inherit heaven. That is not what he's saying there. Because the key word there is inheritance. Inheritance is something that is left for you that you did not work for. Am I right? So every kingdom has its inheritance. It means benefits for being a member of that kingdom. So what he's saying is that if you indulge in the flesh, that you will not be able to enjoy the benefits of the kingdom of God, the things that God had put in place for his children here on earth, you will not be able to enjoy them. He didn't say you're not going to heaven, but you will not be able to lead a victorious Christian life because part of your inheritance as a Christian is to be able to lead a victorious Christian life, to be more than a conqueror. But when you live in the flesh, you will not be able to lead a victorious Christian life. Are you guys getting me this morning? But that is not license for you to go and sin because when you do, you open the door for the enemy to attack you. Because when you pull down the hedge, the serpent will strike. So now is the time for us to fast, to seek God diligently, to sanctify ourselves so that we will be able to discern God's priorities and to walk in his promises. Have you seen why we said we need to fast? So that we can get our priorities right. So let's now get started. How do we go about it? Because that's where the tire will meet the road. But before I tell you how we should go about this fasting, or the discipline of fasting, I would like to sound a note of warning. When you fast, you are not twisting God's arm. Did you get that? It's important to sound that note of warning. When you fast, you're not twisting God's arm. You're not going to make God do anything he does not want to do. What you're actually doing when you fast is that you're positioning yourself and preparing your heart for what is to come. Did you get that? When you fast, you're simply positioning yourself and preparing your heart for what is to come. Because if you're willing to seek him, he 
in turn is willing to give to you. So what it simply means is that your meal time becomes your study time. Take note of that. When you fast, your meal time becomes your study time. Because understanding comes from studying the Word of God. So when you fast and pray, you effectively sharpen the Word of God in your mouth. So one of the greatest things that fasting will do for you, it will break down all of the stuff that accumulates from this world that blocks you from clear communion with the Father. I want you to take special note of that. The greatest thing that fasting will do for you, it will break down all the junk that accumulates from this world. You know, those junks will block you from clear communion with the Father. Part of them are the deeds of the flesh that we read in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. So fasting keeps your arm of feet and your blade sharp. Fasting keeps your arm of feet and your blade sharp. We are still talking on how we can get started. So the first thing that we need to do for us to effectively fast is to create a hit list. Create a hit list. That's the first thing you do. Number one, create a hit list. Why? Because it is good to be very specific in your prayers. So you need to make a list. You need to make a list during your praying and fasting. God told Habakkuk, the prophet, in chapter 2, verse 2, he said, write down the vision and make it plain. So when you fast and pray, the first thing you do, in fact, take out the first day to make your list. Prayerfully make out the list, the things that you really want to fast and pray about. You must be specific. You have to pen it down. Write down the vision and make it plain. Part of the things that will come in your list is your, you target your unsaved loved ones in prayer, write down their names and call, call them out to God as you pray and fast. Not just give me, give me, give me. You start with what pleases God. He wants to see your loved ones saved. So you have to Bring them before him in prayer. Did you get that? Then you can list every other thing. And part of those things that you need to list in this our fasting period is that God should sanctify your motives. I'm giving you some of the prayer points now. Sanctification of your motives. Sanctification of your desires. Sanctification of your attitudes. Granting you the right spirit. Sanctification of your flesh. 
so that you will not yield your flesh, your body, as a tool for the devil to use, especially your tongue, your physique, those talents that God has blessed you with. You present them before him so that you will not yield it as an instrument or as a tool in the hands of the devil. So you can see we are already making our list. Part of your list, and most importantly, is that you may know him. You remember the prayer that Paul prayed in Ephesians? Chapter 1, verses, uh, I think, 18 and 19. You need to put that as one of your major prayer points that you may know him. Because knowing him is to love him. And to love him is to trust him. And to trust him is to have faith in him. So there is no way you can have faith in him without trusting him. And there is no way you can trust him without loving him. And you can never love him. You won't be able to love him until you get to know him. So get to know his attributes. Get to know his names. It will help you to be able to love him. So that becomes one of your prayer points. Because the greatest commandment is that we love him with all our spirit, all our soul, all our strength. So that should be one of our major prayer points during this fasting period. That we might know him. Because you see, when you know him and you will begin to love him as you receive love from him, that's when you can obey his second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. You will never be able to love horizontally until you are able to love vertically. Okay? So it's when you receive love from him, respond by loving him back, then you can now give love. That gives you the sign of the cross. That's why we must always go to Calvary. Because that's the place of love. Part of the major prayer points is that you might be able to love him just like in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. You read it up. God desires that we love him just like he has loved us, that we should respond to his love by loving him back. The next that you need as your major prayer point is that you must have to believe him for boldness. You have to believe him for boldness. Just like in Acts chapter 4, verses 23 to 31, you read it up. Pray and fast for boldness. You need boldness to be able to evangelize. And that is the fastest way that you can please God. When you reach out to the unsaved, you make heaven happy. And when you make heaven happy, heaven will in turn make you happy. Some of you are not receiving the things that you've been praying for simply because you've not given priority to making heaven happy.
Number two, I'm telling you now how you should go about your fasting. We said the fasting is to create a hit list. So we've been able to discuss some of the things that should be in that list. Those of you that are married, bring in your children. Those of you that have brothers and sisters, bring them in your list. Bring your community in your list. Bring our land in your list. Bring the body of Christ in your list. So by the time you make up all this list, you find out that the 12 days will not even be enough. The 24 hours you have in the day will not even be enough. You have more than enough to talk to God about. And why it's important that you make a list is that as these things come to pass, it helps you to build your heart of gratitude to God because as you go to your list and see them come to pass, as you tick them off, it lifts up your heart. You begin to thank God for having done it so that you don't take the glory. Because those things you put in your list are the things that you know that you cannot help yourself with. That's the acid test. Number two, repent of any known sin. You remember when we read what we read in Second Chronicles chapter 7? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and forsake their wicked ways. So God expects us to repent of any known sin. Fasting will bring hidden things to the surface so that you can repent of them. Is that okay? So let's quickly see what the psalmist had to say in Psalm 24. Psalm 24. Psalm 24. I'll begin to read from verse 3. It says that we may climb the mountain of the Lord, we may stand in his holy place. Number four, that's verse four, he answers the question, only those whose hands and hearts are pure. Have you seen it? It says, who may climb the mountain of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place. He gives us the answer, only those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies, they will receive the Lord's blessing and have right standing with God their Savior. They alone may enter God's presence and worship the God of Israel. Is that in your Bible? I will show you another quotation that they use during deliverance, but they don't know what they are talking about. Look at the next verse. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, and let the king of glory enter. What is he talking about? What are those ancient gates? And what are those ancient uh, doors? There are some of the things of the old that you have stored up in your heart. God says, open them up, bring them up, so that I can come in and flush them out of your system. Bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness, they are ancient doors. Because you see, as the, as the days come by, they get older, and you might tend to forget about them. When you say that something is ancient, what are you saying? Old. So what this scripture is saying, those things that have piled up, yeah, the things of the past. It says, bring them up so that I can flush them out of your system. It says, that who is this king of glory, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord invisible in battle. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors, 
and let the King of glory enter. Who is this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. So in fasting, you open up Asian gates and Asian doors. Those things that you have locked up in your heart, I will never forgive such and so person. God says, open it up so that I can come in and take them away. Okay? Some of those things have actually kept you bound. They are like chains now holding you. That you cannot even release yourself from some of this bitterness. If you open up, the Spirit of God will come in and break the chains and set you free. So during this fasting period, those are some of the things that we need to deal with. So we must first of all repent of any known sin. Then we must open up our hearts so that the King of Glory can come in and do what only Him can do. Is that okay? We are talking on how to go about the fasting now. Number three, you need to sanctify yourself. Joshua chapter 3 verse 5, he told the children of Israel, sanctify yourself because this day you are going to see great and mighty things that God will do the next day because we are now going to enter the promised land. That means that you cannot enter the promised land without sanctifying yourself. The new year is coming. We're into the new week. We're into a new month. We need to sanctify ourselves for us to be able to walk with our Heavenly Father. So what does it mean to sanctify? Sanctification is the process of becoming holy in daily life. Sanctification is the process of becoming what? Holy in daily life. And you remember we said that holiness is integrity in action, purity in heart, decorum in appearance, and what again? Unity in language. So there is no way you can walk with the Father with an impure heart. It is practicing purity. That's, I'm talking about sanctification. It's practicing purity. And being set apart from the world and from sin. We need to set ourselves apart from the world and from sin. So that means that during this period of fasting, you need to set yourself apart so that you will be able to seek the face of God. Most importantly about sanctification, it is allowing the Holy Spirit to make us more like Jesus. It is allowing the Holy Spirit to make us more like Jesus in what we do, in what we think, and in what we desire. Did you get that? We are told in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, that when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, that he will produce this fruit in us, the fruit of love, that manifests itself in joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So sanctification simply means that we are allowing the Holy Spirit to control our lives and begin to produce the fruit of the Spirit in us. Because to be like Jesus simply means to have his characteristics. And those characteristics that made Jesus whom he was here on earth was that of joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
They had all the powers, but they said, you guys know that at the flick of my fingers, I can call up the angels, legions of angels, and they will destroy all of you. He said, but I'm not going to do it, because that's not the purpose for which I came. The purpose for my coming is to go to the cross. So he had all the powers, but he brought his power under control so that he will be able to fulfill God's desire. So we need a sanctification of our motives, our desires, our attitudes. We need sanctification of right spirit. We need sanctification of our flesh. The psalmist in Psalm 51 verse 10 cried out. Psalm 51 verse 10. He cried out. He said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Please take note of that. That should be the cry of our heart during this period of fasting. That our Heavenly Father, through His Holy Spirit, should create in us a clean heart and renew the right spirit within us. We should beg him not to banish us from his presence. Of course, he will not take his Holy Spirit away from us, but we can quench the Holy Spirit through our attitude and our behaviors and our conduct. So that should be the cry of our heart, that we should not quench the Holy Spirit. Rather that God should create in us a clean heart so that our desires and attitudes, our motives should be to please Him in all that we do, in all that we think, and in all that we desire. Lastly, Fasting is always a joint exercise. We are doing this fasting as a corporate body. So because we are doing it jointly, we need a spirit of togetherness to be in operation in, in our midst. We need the spirit of trust. We need the spirit of unity. And we need the spirit of compassion for one another. Did you get that? Too many times when a fast is called, it involves more than one person. So that means it's a joint exercise. And because it's a joint exercise, we need the spirit of togetherness. We need the spirit of trust. We need the spirit of unity. And we need the spirit of compassion for one another. So with what you have heard this morning, I think we are set for this great exercise, spiritual exercise, that we have embarked on because we have started. I hope some of you did not eat this morning. <laughs> but if you did, there is no problem. You still have the next six hours to do something. Many of you are already yawning. The enemy of your soul, which is your stomach, is already screaming and crying. And petitioning every cell in your body. But you have to tell your king's stomach that you have made up your mind that I'm going to relegate you to the background. I want to enthrone 
my spirit, because that is what fasting is all about, enthroning your spirit. Can we all stand? Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. You can join us in worship every Sunday by 9 a.m. for World Feast. Venue is at the 7 Option Parks, Laduke Akintola Boulevard, opposite Caribou Hotel, Gerki Abuja. God bless you.